place. Down the middle of nowhere. self-reactive diode mm -hmm. very rare pieces and um, they go back in time with me to when my partners and I would use it to, to detect anti-gravity effects and later on my partner went up and made 70 million dollars with finding oil with these things so what in the world is so special about this diet? Junction barrier technology, self-reactive. I am still trying to find out more information on them. There's a family of them that are very active. This one is at a lot more active to, towards light. Let's check our voltage. Checking our voltage. All right, what is it? You got uh, point two five eight. Wow. 0.258 volts. Mm -hmm. Electron volt. Electron volt. Because this is a this is the te the technology in here is very exciting, and it led me into building power cells and supplies and things like that. So power cells started from this finding a diode on a circuit board <laughs> yeah. and checking it with a voltmeter. Mm-hmm. And well, with two other people at the time, but one one decided to want to make oil finding a business with these things. Okay, all the right. The gravimetric pull of the earth varies with when you're flying over oil and gas deposits. And the voltage would change? Yeah. And so, chart. that's one of the, that's one of the uh, stress lines in the earth. Kind of really cool stuff. Very interesting. So this led you to your basically next invention um, of, the, of the cell technology. Yeah. So how did you transition from this to that? Oh, a lot of study. A lot of study in different areas where self-reactive material was used. And I lucked out, I lucked out with the, um, a barium titanate cylinder and lots of radio cells in Ohio. A barium titanate cylinder? Yeah. And where did you find that? Uh, Fair Radio Sales in Lima, Ohio. And you found this from them. What was this thing in? What was this cylinder out of? Actually, uh, it's interesting because a huge battery of these cylinders were in a sonar unit from the Navy, U.S. Navy. And then they scrapped this stuff out and spare radio cells with a huge shipment in the stuff. Do you know what type of material it is in this diode? Um, I believe, yeah, I think so. Um, germanium is one of them. Gallium is another. And niobium is yet another one, I think. No, I never had one of these um, done, cut up and put to the spectrum analyzer, but going into history and um, trying to figure out what. Doing your research. Yeah, man. Grief. And it takes a, it takes a while to do it. So some of the answers I got from T. Townsend Brown, who had the petroelectric effect. And the electric material, which is wax, self reactive material than other scientists back in time that were doing unique things. How do you make <laughs> wax self-reacting? Ah, it was um, explained to me by a retired engineer who said that you take certain waxes, you vaporize them, How would you heat them up, okay. 
until they get liquid and into a steam, and this steam goes through a condenser, and around this condenser is a uh, high voltage direct current source. So when this, the stuff would drop down and drips and harden, it's going to be... It would be polarized. Polarized and self-reacting. And God, I remember that from picking up one of those by the insulator like this. <laughs> okay. Oh no! <laughs> this wax, do you know what kind of wax it was? And from what I could understand, canuba wax. Something I found out through T. Thomas Brown's research and other research. The Department of Defense documents have a lot of info on them too. Wasn't there something similar to this that was a vacuum technology? Going back in time to the 20s with T. Henry Morris device. Okay. Very, pretty close. And it yeah. worked on the same principle? Junction very always touching points. Okay. Is there an oscillation going on there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's almost touching but not quite, and it's just basically. And what does that oscillation do? Do you know? It sets up um, waves and energy and other materials. Probably best described by uh, one of my sponsors, Dr. Peter Koshinek in Austria, who discovered the, what he called the ether oscillation between two round balls that were just um, oh, millimeters apart. Okay. And so a resonant. That was a major discovery, and I was there when he did it, and he was getting a room prepared to capture this stuff. What were these balls made out of? Uh, basically stainless, stainless steel, but it was quite impressive, and he, he did write that up. So these spheres, it, uh, you talked about a cylinder um, about barium titanate. Mm -hmm. uh, these were cylinders, but were there other shapes that you found? Uh, read about. One was barium titanate sphere. Okay. That the U.S. Army was testing a long time ago, and having about four of them placed in the desert with the fifth one in the middle of which would give it electrostatic repulsion and levitate it. Uh, a friend of mine in Canada also went to where they make barium titanium film using that. He was the only one allowed in there. He had actually got to see a round ball being tested. What did he see? Did he describe it? Super high power coming out of the thing. Voltage? Yeah. And current? Yeah. And just arcing off of this arcing device? Arcing off of it. And, and luckily I, I had my Japanese sponsor, and that had one of my tests at the Kyoto Institute of Technology, gave me all my data on it. Do you have that data? Yeah. We'll and have to try to find it. Oh yeah, it, they resonated 18.5 um, kilohertz, and they have ferromagnetic properties within them, along with other properties, um, piezoelectric properties, of course, ferromagnetics. And yeah, they did a lot of cool tests. So I started out with that too. Okay. So what? And then I graduated to, to chemical type cells and that, and then went back into junction barrier technology like this with the tunable. This is a non conduct or a non um, basically acidic situation where it's all just that junction. Yeah. And exactly. And then. I managed to work out some idea, trial and error, many times until I was able to contact somebody at Surak and Goodfellas that make these things, or willing to help me out on <clears throat> And I sent him a formula and paid him a lot of money, $30,000. I was under sponsorship from Japan, so I had the money. Okay. As well as uh, Germany later on. And they've sent in a, a core to me. All right, so what was the name of this company? Oh, it was called Cerax, C-E-R-A-C, -E and then Goodfellow. the other company was Goodfellows. Okay, and what did you ask them to build you? A core uh, to these engineering specs, which I'd draw out, and of course, it was a bit of communication problems, but that was uh, a while ago, and then eventually they sent me different cores, and some of them would just burn out, disintegrate. Others would be okay. So you have the device that you have, but it doesn't have a core in it currently. Yeah, the core went dead on it, and I sent it back to them a while ago. So this is what the device looks like. Go. We're all caught up here. Mm, that one put out eight, 800 to 1,000 volts. 800 to 1,000 volts. Mm -hmm. What was the amperage? Uh, it was quarter of an ampere. So what is this device here? That is basically a tuning cavity used in some military applications. And for RF um, 
resonance effect. And I use this solely for um, applying pressure on the crystal stack. Okay, so use this. So this was actually designed like this. Yeah. This whole part was built. Yeah. This is a dryer. That's a dryer. It was yeah. just there. Yeah. Oh no, that's that's. You added it. I need a dryer. You okay? So you had to keep this stuff dry. Oh yeah. Okay. Good problem. So we'll open it and show that there's no core in here. Now you have a you have a couple of things on here. You have a, a silver coin. Yeah. With a hole in it. Yeah. Is that important? It's just handy. To have a hole in it. The hole, I know. That's. Is it part of the function? We have found it. Okay, yeah. great. So inside of here. Can, yeah. We can see in here. What material is this? Oh, uh, that's Teflon. Teflon. Yeah. <laughs> is that important? Yeah. Well, Teflon could be um, other materials that are non-conductive. This is just what I had on hand. Non-conductive. Yeah. And this brass cylinder. Gold-plated cylinder. This is a gold-plated brass cylinder. Mm -hmm. And is that important? Um, no. I made them without gold plated. Okay. Mostly silver plated though, that was stuff on hand that I thought would work. How many discs were inside this thing? Oh, you had yeah, them stacked, yeah. right? Yeah, up to 65 of them on this one. 65? So the discs you've kind of described in this diagram we just showed, but can you walk through, I'll hold it up and you can walk through this diagram. Oh, yeah, here. okay. So we start out with the uh, 30 millimeter diameter, up to 40 millimeter diameter, um, frosted quartz wafer, about 16th of an inch thick and down. But every 50 of them would vary slightly by maybe a thousandth of an inch or less. And there'd be uh, such things on these as uh, rare earth oxides in different combinations and thicknesses. And do you remember? You've, you've written here, maybe you can yeah. read out exactly which materials you have on here. Yeah, let's see what I have here. I have uh, rhodium oxide, or sasquide sus as it's called. Rhenium, barium, titanate of course, indium, silver oxide, niobium, gallium, galena, micro cat whiskers, titanium, tungsten, crystal wafer, 116, 164 thick frosted, 50 in this one. I have here pressure by uh, micrometer C, micrometer unit, and a hundredth of an inch, 25 feet plate. Okay. So these here, closer up here, you yeah. see all these cat whiskers. Yeah, here. what is the cat whiskers? Was it an actual cat whisker? It was off of a cat? No, not off a cat. Oh, no, man. It okay. Sensory, it's a long, like, cylindrical thing that's sharp like this. Is it hollow? No. no it's cylinder, really. It's, well, just a... Cat whisker! Cat whisker. But what is it made out of? Um, the applications go way back in time to very thin wires used on galena crystals. Okay. Pick up radio signals. Okay. So and they were coated specially? Uh, just tungsten. Sometimes tungsten coated. Okay. Silver or uh, nickel steel. What's their what's their purpose? You have them in between each wafer here. They were to join in point contact junction barrier activation. So basically, they would push against those wafers, and that was what the reaction happened. Yeah. No, because you can take a, a sharp, pointy thing and stick it in hydrogen peroxide, and it'll release bubbles. Okay. But if you took the same thing that wasn't sharp, it wouldn't release bubbles. Okay. So it was actually a way of, um, if you want to call it, electron flow the way of point of contact. And then later on, cat whiskers were used in such things as transistors technology. Oh really? The cat yeah. whiskers were actually used in standard older... Old style transistors like this from the 60s. Okay. Then refer to them as cat whiskers. Cat whisker transistor? It's cat whiskers used in junction barrier technology. Very interesting. Sharp points. Yeah, it, it is. And then also with uh, diodes, the same thing. So the, so the barium titanate, did you use that idea to build this, to get that method of the, the wafers that you wanted to make? Yeah, it, it went in different forms. It slowly went with the barium titanate still being connected to the wafers. Then eventually got rid of that and then had this the wafers. So when I was giving demonstrations to Ken, I had barium titanate and the stack like that, that uh, between it. And, you know, you get on for a large group of people, 
audience and main media and start tuning it and it's kind of like What's he doing? No, it's gonna go on and off. <laughs> okay. It not work at all. You weren't for sure. Uh, it's, yeah, I because it, was, it didn't work. It works, but not all the time. And you had to get it tuned just right, so you were under a big pressure. Oh yeah, it was a riot. Because <laughs> I had two guys, uh, two media people right here filming everything that I was doing. Because I took it all apart to show them no hidden What was inside there. of there? Yeah. So, when I first started doing that, wearing my Star Trek shirt. <laughs> oh, oh, nothing. And all of a sudden kicked in, so I... So it's a particular pressure. And what did you have hooked up to it? Mm, I had light bulbs hooked up to this thing. Incandescence? Mm-hmm. And it would have enough current to run an incandescent light bulb? Yep. At a couple hundred volts or more? A hundred volts. I had a, the most impressive one I ever had. It lasted with me about five years, four years. It's about this tall. And it was a stack. It was uh, 26 volts at a quarter amp. Very light. And I could carry it around when I invited to um, go out on Lanny Smith's WebWorks TV show in Washington State. I'd take it down there, or other places I'd take it and show them. And going through customs, they, they thought it was kind of cool. That's a free energy device. Can you want extra right? And they answer, that is really cool. <laughs> There's no cylinder. There's no. There's no wafers in here. Do you have any of these wafers? No, not not here. No, they're all gone back for analysis. So, so you sent them back for analysis. Yeah. A no failure. Right. Yeah, they'll be put away for a long time until they afford another stack of them. I guess. So it's so, worth it. So is this company you think still around? We could call oh. them and order these. Uh, probably if you want to send in an order for them. Well, Cirac or Bitfo. We'll have to try that. What What's the point of failure? in these devices that you constructed because a lot of them after a period of time would quit but mm -hmm. what was the reasoning that they would stop do you know uh it's almost like self-destruction i've had one that was um self-destructed with seventy thousand volts oh made for the japanese with a cubic foot a cubic foot yeah of wafers no no a whole different type of system i had okay this was similar a to type. this kind of thing right Huge. Can you explain to this other type of technology that you based this off of? This cubic foot that was oh. 70,000 volts. All started with Jezebel with the uh, <laughs> sonar system in uh, HMCS uh, Saskatchewan, a Navy ship. So okay. I opened this drawer up, classified, do not. Okay, but that means we bought the ship with mine now. So it's yeah. <laughs> just classified, it means look at it closely. Yeah, it was really I'm surprised they even left it here. Anyway, I took this thing out, big round container like that. What was the container made of? It's actually aluminum for aluminum. Okay. So um, I thought, well, what's in here? So I worked around all the screws and I had to pry it apart because they're all kind of compacted. Sealed stuff. tightly? Yeah. Got that off and then I was prying around and pull out all this like um, insulation material. Then out come these beautiful wafers. Wafers? Yeah, big uh, hexagonal wafers about mm, 75 millimeter maybe. And they were in the sign of a shape of a stop sign? The ed the edges? Yeah, something like that. But but they were thin? Quarter inch thick. Wow. Silver plated. And and what, what what was this device? Unknown to this. Well, I know that it was self-reactive material. They put up voltage. So you could just check it and see voltage coming out of it. Yeah. And so you took that idea, but did you know mm. what it was made out of? Or how did you take that idea and apply it to this new cell that you built? So I put this, okay, I put this at my place, off the warship, I put this stuff in a cubic foot container made by, made by the Japanese. Blanket. You took it directly from that ship, those wafers, and put them in this box? Yeah, the later, jet. after I got it all fixed up, Load it full of Rochelle cells and <laughs> Galena and Germanium dust with uh, lots of nail beam pins. Okay. And how were, how were the pins inch. configured? Oh, they were dropped down a certain depth all through the whole thing. Okay. 16th inch diameter? The. I guess so, 132 maybe. And was that your electrode in the top? That was the anode because it's very electrically active. Okay. And then what was your anode? My anode, uh, okay, the outside was um, 
Yeah, outside of ground, it's dead center with the <laughs> with hot, but it's positive. So. And this thing started arcing. I had within a four bearing cylinder. So you put four bearing, bear, you put the four cylinders in there. Well, I know you had the wafers in there. Yeah. And your other mixture of shell salts and other good stuff, yeah. all in one big box. Square, square key, a square foot. And what happened? Well, I was charging it, like we'd give it initial information to um, charging it. With what were you DC, charging with? DC? DC volts, yeah. High voltage? No, it's around 12 volts DC. 12 volts DC. Give it memory. You have to heat it up and it slowly recrystallize. As it's cooling, you're giving it memory? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then what happened? It did light a, a light bulb, just a little bit. I thought, that's pretty cool. What kind of light bulb? Incandescent 50. 60 watts? Yeah. Okay. That thing, I was sitting on the toilet, I had no other place to put the thing. So me and I said, well, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of tired. I work on the warships all day. Mm -hmm. So I was laying down, laying down in, in the other room, and I heard some strange little crackling sound. I thought, you know, it's just cooling down or something. <laughs> How long after you put it on the toilet, like you heated it up, you've done that process, it was like maybe an hour or two after that, do you recall? It wasn't that hot really, it would be back from one to heat it up. But okay. Just enough for it to get hot and recrystallize so, and give it information. But by that time, the power supply was disconnected off of it. Uh-huh. You heard these noises. I <laughs> looked. I looked around and uh, I heard more funny sounds. I better get up and take a look what's going on. So I did, and I saw between where the Hanovian pins were sticking up, sparks jumping across the other pin. To the outside. Pin to pin? Or yeah, pin to casing? No, pin. Pin to pin? Pin to pin, yeah. Whoa. Very weird. And the light bulb was getting brighter and brighter. I said, oh dear. Okay. Let's see what happens. So it got worse and worse and worse and worse. The light bulb got so bright it burned out. <laughs> Sparks got bigger and bigger and bigger. And making humming sounds like... Okay, I've heard of such things as opening up a dimension. <laughs> and other people talking about this crazy stuff. Now, what happens if this doesn't stop? I'm in big trouble. Sounds like it's getting worse. And I was thinking I might have to phone the fire department on this one. I would get in a mess like this. Yeah. And luckily at 70, rough guess, 70,000 volts, the thing gave up. It just quit? Quit. Smoke and fire? Smoke and fire, burn, the, uh, burn part of the toilet, back end of it. Well, why, why do you think it was 70,000? What's your guess? Just measuring the uh, spark left. Measuring the arc length yeah. and knowing what that is. And it's hitting right into the porcelain, which is strange too, in the toilet. Wow. The most stable one I ever had was portable and had no uh, pressure control on it, actually. Okay. And it was used in a variety of TV shows. Was that this wafer technology? Yeah. That yeah. was this wafer technology. And, and the fun part of, part of it was with the wafer technology, it wasn't in a container like this, it was plastic. So I carefully would peel down and get rid of the plastic so you could actually see through it. You could see it, what was inside there. Yeah, and my partner Grant Lamond at the time, he was so fascinated by it, he did a lot of filming of it. So that technology was the same, but you didn't have to add pressure on that one? Yeah, yeah. What was the difference? Well, it was just that it was stabilized, it involved pre-pressurized with okay. the plastic. Okay, so you would set it and then, yeah. and it would be... It would be happy. Different approach to it. And okay. again, it lasted four years on various travels and TV shows and then it just accidentally broke it. You accidentally broke it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, over time when I peeled away all that plastic, you have uh -huh. something pulling on one side all the time that's under tension. Uh-huh. And it started to form a, a crack. And it pushed itself open? Yeah, and I thought, oh well. It, <laughs> had, it had a lot of fun. Well, hmm. It's from these devices, you started making something called a Johnny Tube. Well, I, yeah, I, I suggested to other people on how to make it, I guess. Okay, and what, it, what is a Johnny Tube? 
It's a kind of like a crystal power cell, and it's RF fed information into it. So it's along with the intentional information from the people that are making them. Okay, so instead of using like a DC power that you're using for information, where you're actually using the RF and audio signals as they cool to put information in these Johnny cells. Yes. Or Johnny uh, tubes. Some of the people need to reference that work they probably could look up Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Intentional psychology, psychotronic, all that cool stuff. Um, what kind of information are you putting in here? What? Why? Why? Why are you doing that? Why are well, you putting we're doing RF in there? Anti radiation research. Okay. So it's basically a self-powering device, mm -hmm. and it's also got the correct frequencies within it to do what to the radiation. To kind of give it information, the subatomic part of it goes to go to sleep and leave the atoms alone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Pretty crazy, but... It sounds right. crazy, but you've tested this stuff, mm -hmm. and it seems to function. Seems to function. Very interesting. So have you used radio frequencies in the past on your older cells? Yeah, actually, I think I did, if I recall. Do you know what the purpose was? Oh, more or less RF heating. RF heating? Yeah. So what did Mostly that Mostly I would use DC voltage to, to produce raw power. Okay, so the so the RF would actually heat the material and set. That's how mm -hmm. you were using it to Not the so. RF? No, I got back to basics with a little heater. Okay. So it did, better. <laughs> did, it did, it was this experiment, but that's what you were doing with the RF at that time. Yeah, back in time. Okay. Mostly it was the use some other crazy stuff I did at that time. John, I really got to go to the bathroom right now because I had too much coffee. Where's the toilet? Oh, it's just uh, down over there um, to your um, left hand side. Okay, and is, <laughs> is it going to blow up with these cells? You've got cells in this thing? No, none, none sitting in there now. You're sure? You're, you'll be safe, guaranteed. Well, I had enough with electric fences, so I really don't need any more <laughs> toilets. Guaranteed, no problem. Okay, go All try right. it. Thank you, John. You're very welcome. Oh, man, it goes so bad again. John, buddy, you really need to flush the toilet next time because, uh, quite frankly, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> <laughs>